uh, Peter talks to a group of uh, elect exiles, as we've mentioned before, those who have been set apart by Christ to live uh, in a world that has got all kinds of problems and difficulties. These Christians had already faced persecution. They were, Peter was expecting they would face even more persecution. And so he's giving them instructions about how they're to go about living in this world. And I think we always need to remember, guys, we have been saved by God's grace. And we know where we're headed, don't we? So what, what happens to us in the flesh really is of no importance to us as long as we're faithful to live out the calling that God has given to us. Jesus said in this world, you shall have tribulation. If you try to live out the radical claims of Jesus Christ in your life, Satan's going to make sure that you're persecuted. Now, some of, for some of us, that means we're ridiculed, we're made fun of. Uh, for some, it means you lose your job. Uh, for some, uh, it means that uh, you may get hauled off to jail and put into prison. In Islamic countries, if you convert to Christianity, you fall under a death sentence. And uh, we have brothers and sisters in Christ that refuse to be a part of the, quote, Chinese church because it doesn't really honor the Lord. And so they have house churches and they'll put, they would probably put six or seven hundred big people in a building like this, but they'll get a little bit of living room and they'll put 50 or 60 people in there where they're standing room only just to get the privilege to worship Jesus Christ and serve Him. We talked about last Sunday night, we talked about how Christ is our example. And so what I want to do is just to back up and uh, from chapter 3 back into chapter 2 uh, to read what the Bible tells us about Christ because He is our model of submission, how we're su supposed to submit. And why do we submit? We submit so that Christ can be honored. So that when people look at us, they don't see us, they see Jesus. That's why Peter has given us the instructions that he's given us in this passage. So let's back up and uh, read verse 21 of chapter 2, and then we'll read through verse 7 of chapter 3. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in His steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in His mouth. When He was reviled, He did not revile in return. When He suffered... He did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Likewise, just like Christ was willing to suffer just like he was willing to trust himself to his heavenly father the sovereign God of all the universe trust that God is going to do the right thing trust that God is going to do justly and so Christ was willing likewise wives be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. As we come to this passage tonight, uh, we need to understand submission 
is meant to be mutual submission. First of all, we are to submit ourselves under the authority of God, both husband and wife. And then we are supposed to mutually submit to one another so that when the lost people in this world look at us, they see what it really means to live a Christian life. So let's just kind of walk through this. Uh, relationships in the home provide additional examples of the principle of submission. Uh, it demonstrates, when you and I submit to one another, it demonstrates our trust in God. It demonstrates that we trust that God is going to bring us to His desired end. Now that may not be what we desire, but that's what God desires. Uh, as in other areas of the life, our life, the family becomes a witness to what God has done in our life. It, it becomes a witness to our trust in the one who is able to bring to fruition and bring to completion His will in our lives. Wives were, as Peter says here, to submit themselves to the authority of God that God has established in the home. Now, you and I don't get to decide what the authorities are. God has determined what the authorities are. And just like you and I need to learn to submit to in the workplace to those that are over us, just like you and I need to learn to submit to uh, the government that God has placed over us, that's an authority. The Bible tells us there's not one government on this planet that doesn't exist at God's good pleasure. That doesn't mean that God put it there. It just means He allowed it to happen. Uh, God hates sin of any kind. God hates sinful structures of any kind. So God doesn't approve of, of uh, governments that abuse their citizens. But that government exists at God's good pleasure. And you and I are called to submit. Wives, you're called to submit to the authority that God has placed over you. Uh, now that doesn't mean, wives, that you have to obey your husband's every command. If your husband commands you to do something that is against God's word, just like if the government tells you that you've got to do something against God's word, God's word always takes precedence. Peter understood that. You remember? We used that example last week of how Peter uh, was brought in before the religious authorities and, and commanded never to preach in the name of Jesus. And Peter says, well, you guys are going to have to do what you got to do. Uh, but I've got to preach the message because the ultimate authority in our life is always God. So if your husband tells you to do something that's outside the will of God, you have scriptural authority not to listen. Paul or Peter, neither one, ordered wives to put themselves in harm's way. I have, I've counseled with women before. In fact, one of the issues going on in our Southern Baptist Convention right now is something that somebody did 20 or 30 years ago uh, in some instructions they gave to a woman, uh, a leader of an institution, and it's created a firestorm in the Southern Baptist Convention. I have told women, and those of you, I don't know that I've counseled with anybody here, but people that I've counseled with before, I tell women all the time, if you're in a situation where your husband is abusing you, get out as quickly as possible. Because my experience and the experience of social workers and the experience of counselors and psychologists, experience of law enforcement officers, violence will only continue to escalate once it starts. And God does not want you to be in harm's way. Uh, as you graciously submit, though, to your husband's authority, you honor them, but more importantly, you honor Christ. If a, if a husband is trying to do the right thing, if he's trying to lead his family and the worship of God is trying to lead his family to be a godly family. And it says here, what we're going to talk about in a minute what guys are supposed to do. But if a husband is trying to lead in a godly way, then wives, you are to graciously submit to your husband's leadership. Now, you won't hear that in our society today, will you? 
basically our society tells us we ought to do whatever we want to and my truth is my truth and your truth is your truth and you ought to do whatever makes you feel good. You know, I've read this Bible plenty of times in the last 30, 40, 50 years. And I don't read anywhere where it says you're supposed to do what you want to do. And that my truth is truth. I believe this thing says Jesus is the truth, does it not? And God's word is truth. So God is the one who sets the standards for us. Wives, as you submit yourself to your husbands, you demonstrate Christ's example, the example that he has set for you by submitting under the authorities that God had placed over him. Now you're talking about the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords, the one who is ruling over all things until all enemies are placed under his feet and will rule for all eternity. But when he was incarnated in the flesh, he subjected himself to the authorities that God had placed over him. When he was a young boy and his parents looked for him in the temple, what happened? The Bible says when they found him, he said, Don't, didn't you know I'd have to be about my father's business? But the next scripture says, he returned with his parents and submitted to their role in his life. That's what God wants us to do. Uh, of course, since we are to demonstrate Christ's example in the way in which we suffer, uh, submission cannot be understood to be something contrary to the nature and the pattern of Jesus. So, if your husband asks you to do something that's evil, for example, or ungodly, then you're not supposed to submit to that because that would not be following Christ's example of godly submission, would it? So you and I are called to submit in such a way that we honor Christ. Uh, and of course, as Peter talks about here, he says, well, likewise, be subject to your own husband so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without word, without a word by the conduct of their wives. So Peter's talking about a number of different relationships. First of all, he's talking about relationship where both husband and wife are Christians. But even in some situations where your husband is not a Christian, if that husband is, is not asking you to do something Ill, you know, illegal or immoral or ungodly, then hopefully you graciously submitting to his leadership in your life will hopefully win him to Christ. And I've heard stories of that happening where wives graciously submitted to the leadership of their husband and eventually the husbands were won to faith in Christ because of the way that they lived out the, their Christian commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, godly submission, the manner of godly submission, of course, is always pure. Uh, notice what he says here. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So I mentioned before that gentle and quiet spirit sometimes wins a husband that's not a Christian. And sometimes a Christian, a, a, a husband who is a Christian, but may be an immature Christian. You know, maybe they've walked down the aisle, they've accepted Christ, but they never bothered to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe they stay home all the time, they never go to church. Ladies, don't let that stop you from following Christ and submitting yourself uh, to His Lordship. Uh, godly wives demonstrate their submission and respect for their husbands by the way they adorn themselves. Now, the pagan women of that day and time wore fancy clothes, those who were wealthy, wore fancy clothes with fancy jewelry. Now, there's nothing wrong with a lady dressing up and putting on fancy jewelry and nice clothes. That's not what Peter's saying. There's nothing wrong with looking nice, okay? That's not what Peter's trying to point out. What Peter's trying to say is, more importantly than what's on the outside of us, it's what's on the inside of us. We ought to have a gentle and a quiet spirit. We ought to behave in the fear of the Lord. Whatever the wife does in response to her husband's leadership within the family is to be pure, 
and reverent, demonstrating the wife's obedience to Christ. Uh, you know, self-image does not rely on external adornments or external dress up or clothes or jewelry or whatever. What's in the inside is what expresses the beauty of Christ. In fact, if you remember Proverbs 31 in that passage of Scripture where it talks about an industrious woman, it says this, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. Ladies, most of y'all know, most of us are not spring chickens anymore. And, uh, you know, as you grow older, the way you look changes, doesn't it? You don't look like you did when you were in your 20s. We were looking at some pictures of something. What were we, we were watching, looking at something this afternoon, and pictures of, and I don't remember, but this was a young couple that just got married, and I said, asked my wife, I said, did we look like that? They look like kids, you know? <laughs> Yeah, we did. We looked like kids, I know, because we were kids when we got married. But uh, ladies, what God wants from you is for you to love Him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and to dedicate yourself to living in such a way that's pleasing unto Him where even if you never speak a word of witness about Christ, your life will witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, to who He is in your life. The beauty of a godly heart is imperishable. You know, even when this life is over with and we've died, that internal beauty, you get to take that with you when you go to heaven. The wisdom that God gives, the gentle and quiet spirit. The, a meek spirit shows great strength of character. Peter used the example of Sarah who submitted to Abraham to show that ladies who did that were honorable women. He used that as an example to show them. Uh, by submitting, just like some Sarah did submitting to Abraham, it shows a woman's hope is in God. So in other words, the women, as Peter called upon them, and as he tells us today, uh, they could obey their husbands because they trusted that God would work in their husbands' lives. Do you trust that God can work in your husband's life? Let me tell you about a lady by the name of Miss Fern. Miss Fern did what Miss Carolyn does for us. She always does a great job. Miss Fern cooked cook, cook food and organized all of our eating establishments. But she had a husband that was not a Christian. They'd been married almost 60 years, probably in the 50-year range when I became her pastor. Every pastor, every layperson in our church had been through and talked to her husband about accepting Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Now, he wasn't just a, he wasn't a really mean man. He, he wasn't you know, a very gracious person, but he wasn't really mean either. But he just needed Jesus. And I remember her coming to my office one day in tears, saying, Pastor, will my husband ever get saved? And I said, don't give up. You just keep praying. And, and we had deacons that go by and witness to him. I went by on two or three different occasions and witnessed to him. And, and his answer was always this. He said, I'm just not ready. One day, out of the blue, another pastor went by to see him. Somebody who'd been by to see him before, had witnessed to him before. And he got to the point and, and, and said, don't you want to invite Christ into your life? By this time, Miss Fern and Mr. Tom had been married 60 years. And that day, when this pastor asked him if he wanted to invite Christ in his heart, he said, yes, I do. 60 years of a lady faithfully living out what it means to be a gracious wife. Her godly conduct eventually bore fruit in her husband's life. Ladies, don't give up. You just keep being faithful and doing what God has called you to do. Notice, too, that Peter also speaks to husbands. Husbands, you and I have a greater role and a greater responsibility than, than you and I can even imagine. If you go to the book of Ephesians and you look there, it tells us, first of all, that there's to be mutual submission under the Lordship of Christ. Christ. 
Husbands and wives are first and foremost supposed to submit themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they are to submit themselves in love to each other. You know, my experience as a pastor is about 38 years. If I make it till November, I'll be 38 years at that point. My experience has been if a husband is a godly man who is seeking to do the right thing and loves his wife unconditionally, most women that I know don't have a problem submitting to that kind of leadership when a husband leaves from that kind of standpoint. Husbands, it says here, you're to live with your wives in an understanding way. Typically, and I know when you start talking like this, and I'm going to make some statements that are general statements. I want you all to understand, okay? They don't always fit. But if you look at the population as a whole, uh, typically men are more focused on mental actions and, and mental stuff. And women are oftentimes more emotional than men. Now, I know that doesn't always pan out, okay? But I'm just saying, uh, typically, that's the way it works. And what your wife, guys, needs from you is we start thinking about Father's Day next weekend. You know, tell you the best present you could give your wife is to be a godly husband who lives with his wife in an understanding way. That means, guys, you and I need to listen. Now, I'm, what I'm saying is, I want y'all to know, is I've got one finger pointed at y'all. I've got three pointed back at me. My wife's going to remind me of the sermon after I go home, okay? But they want us to understand them. They want us to listen to them. They don't always want us to fix something. All right, guys are the kind of thing, if, if somebody comes to us and says, this needs to be fixed, or this is the problem, our first inclination is to go fix it. A woman simply wants us to listen and empathize, act like we care. Listen is the big thing. I have selective hearing. My wife knows that. She sometimes has to get my attention. She doesn't usually have to throw anything at me, but she usually can get my attention, you know. But most of us guys, sometimes we don't listen very well. And one of the ways that we can live with our wife in an understanding way is to listen and to empathize with what they're saying. Don't try to fix it, just listen, okay? And that's hard for us, I know, but we can do it. You just have to train yourself to do it. Another way you can live in an understanding way with your wife is to honor her above all others. To honor her above all others. To love your wife, as Paul says, love your wife as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Enough to die for it, didn't he? His bride is special. The Bible says that God's adorning his bride, the church, for his second coming. We sang about heaven songs tonight. There's coming a day when Jesus is coming back to get us. And he's adorning the church. And we're supposed to love our wives as much as Jesus loves the church. We need to hold them in high esteem. We need to put them on a pedestal. We need to do everything within our power to meet every need that they have. We are to show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now that's one of those general statements that Peter makes, like I'm trying to make. There are exceptions. I've known some women that were pretty strong. You know, there's some women that fight in the military that probably are stronger than I am. But generally speaking, women typically are a little bit weaker than, well, they're not really. Weaker in some things, but not others. I don't, men, you and I are a bunch of wusses. I, I don't think we could have babies. I don't, don't think we could deal with the pain. You know, we get, we get a splinter in our finger and you think the world's coming to an end. You know, a, a women goes through childbirth and just acts like it's no big deal, you know. But that's just the way we are. But because women have the tendency to be more geared towards emotional uh, things, uh, then you and I need to honor them. Notice it says, we need to honor them as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you in the grace of life 
so that your prayers may not be hindered. Guys, we're heirs of God, aren't we? And co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And your wife, if you both are Christians, is also your sister in the Lord. And I mow most families. One thing I've noticed about most families, they can fight amongst each other. But you better not dare step in the middle of that. Because both of them will turn on you, won't they? Anybody, do I get, can I get a witness? You know, y'all know what I'm saying, right? So as you think about your wife, not only do you need to think about her as your wife, but you need to think about her as your sister in the Lord. Notice he says, so that your prayers will be not hindered. Unconfessed, ongoing sin of any kind is an impediment to prayer. The husband who does not treat his wife well is in rebellion against the Lord and it will impact your prayer life. Husbands, if you're trying to pray and something's messing up your prayer life, you don't feel like your prayers are getting above the ceiling, ask yourselves, am I treating my wife the way she deserves to be treated as a co-heir of Jesus Christ? And as a person who ought to be honored, ask yourself that question. Because if your prayers are being hindered, it may be that you're not treating your wife the way she ought to be treated. We are to love and to honor our wives. God is so good to us, isn't He? Because He loves us enough that he sent his son to die for us. That's what Paul's talk, I mean, Peter's talking about up here in these verses that we read. He bore our sins on the, in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and to live to righteousness. What Peter's talking about here about husbands and wives is how you and I go about living in righteousness. I'll tell you something else. You let a husband and wife live under the authority of Christ and mutually submit to one another and deeply care about and love each other and honor each other and submit to one another, the world takes notice of that. You ever heard somebody say, how in the world did y'all make it so long? You know, people that have been married and married a long, long time. You know, how did you do that? Or, or help me to know how I'm supposed to do something. I mean, the world takes notice when you and I live like God's Word tells us that we're supposed to live. I'll tell you another thing, your children take notice. You know, one of the things that we're charged with as parents is to bring up godly offspring, to bring up children who live in the fear and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The best thing that you can do for your children is to love your spouse. Deeply, unconditionally, show them the love of Christ. That's the best thing you can do for your children. Because they will take notice of what you do a lot more often than they'll listen to what you have to say. Especially when they get to be teenagers, right? Teenagers don't listen to anything because they're smarter than you are. Okay? But when... When they're smaller, they, they will pay attention to your example. And so God has given us instructions. Now think about this in light of what, what Peter's talking about. Peter's writing to a bunch of Christians who have already faced some persecution, but they're going to be facing even more persecution. And he's telling them to submit to the authorities that God has placed over them so that it will reflect their relationship with Jesus. Think about the world when they look at Christian families. What do they see? Unfortunately, sometimes they see all the broken homes inside the church as well as outside the church. And I know that we're all sinful human beings and there are reasons. I, that's not the focus of my sermon but what would happen, guys, if you and I set godly, made godly examples and godly models of what it meant to live in submission to one another 
hopefully, prayerfully, they would say, God lives at that house, and I want to know about that God. Because that God makes a difference in how these people live inside their house as well as outside their house when everybody's watching. And so as you think about this thing called submission, get together with one another, pray for one another, lift up one another. Husbands, it, you know, it's pretty obvious that you and I are supposed to pray for our wives and pray for our families, even though sometimes that's hindered by the way we treat them. But one of the greatest things you can do for your wife is to pray for her. That's a great privilege, is it not? But it's also a great responsibility. This world's an evil place. Y'all figured that out yet? Anybody? Y'all figured that out, right? This world's an evil place. And we need God's hand of protection upon us every day that we live. Every time we step outside the door of the house, we need God on our side. And so by submitting to one another out of fear and reverence for the Lord, we bring honor to our Savior. We bring honor to our spouse. We bring honor to God's church family. Because see, families and church is made up of families, isn't it not? And so all of that brings honor and glory to Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we leave here tonight, I pray, God, that Lord, if there's anybody here that's struggling in their marriage right now, Father, I pray that you will help them look up and look to you. And Father, find strength. Lord, if, if there's somebody here in an abusive relationship, Lord, I pray that you give them great wisdom at what they need to do and when they need to do it. Father, if there's relationships here that are not as strong now as they once were, Lord, I pray that you'll help repair those so that, God, you can be honored and glorified in each of our families, in each of our marriages this very night. Lord, as we go out and we live among a people that don't understand you, that don't understand what it means to be a Christian, Lord, I pray that we'll live in such a way inside our families, outside our families, so that people will take notice that we've been with you and that you've made a radical difference in our lives and in the way in which we live it. And Father, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless y'all. Y'all have a good evening.